Welcome to the Core Concepts Lecture Series. This is a show where you can find things that you wouldn't even know to look for on the internet. And you can do so by going to youtube.com and then typing in Redford Broadcast Network. And our guests are generally religious leaders or spiritual leaders or sometimes lone wolves who come to tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. In other words, how did they come to that belief system and how is it manifesting in their lives? What are they doing with it? And our guest today is Nathan Hill. And Nathan is with the Memphis Leadership Foundation, but as a, a member of that group, he has developed a very unique ministry. And so today he'll talk to us a little bit about the Memphis Leadership Foundation and about his life's path and uh, his uh, specific me uh, uh, ministry as the uh, cooperative computer ministry. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Well, thank you, Jim. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, yeah, again, my name is Nathan Hill, yeah. and um, I'm not a na native Memphian, as you can tell from mm -hmm. my voice. <laughs> um, I grew up in Vermont, and, um, um, and I came to Memphis for the first time was in 1987, and what brought me here was um, prison ministry the first time. And uh, <clears throat> in my, for my own life journey, I grew up in a somewhat Christian family, um, but um, my parents encouraged that we go to church, but we didn't all go together. And, uh, but I had a wonderful spiritual journey, but I, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what God's will for my life was. And, but I decided prison ministry was a good, good place to be for a while anyways. Who in the prison ministry uh, inspired you to do that? Well, what happened was when I was, when I was in college, I went to the University of Vermont. And, um, and I was very involved in university Christian fellowship and different ministries. Um, I did a lot of work with the homeless at that point in college. And, but <clears throat> my senior year, I was... <clears throat> Um, needing a place to, to move to because my uncle had passed away and I couldn't live at his house any longer. And I had called a friend of mine that ran this halfway house called Dismas House in Vermont. And he, at first, the first time I called him, I asked him for a, an apartment for this homeless veteran. And he didn't have any, but he said, Nate, if you want to move in, we have a, a place for a student. And at that, at first, I didn't need one, but then later I called him up. I needed one, so I, my last semester in college, I lived in this business house, which was a halfway house for former prisoners and students. And the first night I went to dinner there, before moving in, it was a wonderful experience because people didn't talk about the crime they committed or their past. They talked about what they did <clears throat> as a community that weekend, this past weekend, or what they were planning on doing. There was a wonderful spirit of reconciliation, a wonderful spirit of, of justice, is what I felt. So for a semester, I lived at that house. And this man was interviewing the staff, and, and he asked if I wanted to work for Dismas House. And I said, where? And he said, Nashville. So I thought I was going to end up in Nashville, not Memphis. <laughs> I started to ask you how you, if you felt Memphis was in a spit particular need or how did you come, yeah, to come so here? It, just, it, was, it was one of those things I thought I would work in an inner city for a couple of years and then I would go back to Vermont. You know, my, my family had, you know, at one point it was 86 acres of land and we weren't much of a farming family but it was a beautiful spot. And, you know, I had some hope maybe a retreat center set up there or something like that. And uh, so it ended up being Memphis instead of Nashville. But the other part of the journey is it's one time when I was at with in college with University Christian Fellowship, I didn't have enough money for the hotel to stay at where this conference was, and but I figured I'd just work at a either at a shelter while I was at the conference or I'd do something. But when I got to Chicago, this was I don't remember what year it was now, but I stayed at a, I found a community called Chapusa, which was Jesus People USA. I don't know if you ever heard of them or not, but Resurrection Band came out of their ministry and some other things. But it was a type of community life I wasn't quite ready for. <laughs> but 
but it was a good it was a good thing to you know who they were more like a commune it was it was a christian commune that i mean all the kids called everybody mom and dad at that time oh. and i just you know, i just wasn't quite ready to share somebody's underwear <laughs> <laughs> that was a little bit different so but um but i stayed there for a couple of nights but the as I was going to the, the convention, I was on the subway system and I had the misfortune. Here I was, a white guy with a three-piece suit carrying a duffel bag and a briefcase. You know, and I, don't, I get off the subway at the wrong stop. I'm not thinking real straight, but, you know, there's a telephone there and a few young African-American folks just over on the park bench. And I wasn't thinking, you know. But next thing I hear is patter, pitter-pattering of feet and all of a sudden, Something's around my throat. I'm, I pass out. I remember somebody lifting my wallet. But, oh, dear. And, but when I come to, the three guys around the park bench were still going through my stuff. <laughs> and they were trying to say I wasn't mugged. They were, yeah, and, and one guy asked me what this thing was, and I said it was a travel alarm clock. And he said, oh, we can't get much for that. And he put it back in the bag, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so the train came, the subway thing. I got my stuff together. My prayer was they wouldn't find the second wallet in the briefcase because I only had $100 to my name for the week. And uh, so, um, but I got on the train, I say to the conductor, I say, I asked her if she could call the police and the three folks that got into the train, you know, were at least witnessed if they weren't involved. And she said, no, the next stop you can get out and you can report it. And I said, but if I get out and report it, you're going to leave? And she said, yeah. Let's, so I, I kind of wonder what that would do, but I, I went through the process, you know. So I, I report that they, my prayer was that they would, they, the one thing that they took from the briefcase was a Panasonic stereo to go, similar to a Walkman, okay, and uh, it had an Amy Grant tape. So maybe <laughs> maybe if they, they listened to that, maybe they turned their life around. I don't know. I wasn't sure. You know? So, but the, the second wallet was still in the briefcase, okay. So I still had money for food for the week, you know. So, um, and, but a month after that experience, I get a package in the mail. And it was my wallet, and it came from the dead letter branch of the post office. They just, they took the money and just put the, the wallet in, 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 in the mailbox. Well, that's <laughs> nice, I mean, right. <laughs> And so, but everything worked out for the conference. And that was in which city? That was in Chicago. In Chicago. And so when I was thinking about different places that the inner city that I was going to work in, I said, ah, I, would, I, I like Chicago. There was, some, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to go back there right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in, in coming to Memphis, the Dismas House, um, in Vermont, it was pretty much half students and half former prisoners. Vermont, you do not have very many minority folks. So we, ideally in Memphis, I forget the house would be half male, half female, half black, half white, and half students, and half prisoners. prisoners. This is what I think it. But what Memphis did was, they said there were too many people in prison. They opened up the house to the former prisoner first, and then expected the students to move in. And it had been a struggle to get students committed to living in community. I could get students to play volleyball to help with any kind of, if they were in a GED class, or I could help to get them to do cooking. But I could not, you know, to that hurdle to actually live in the same house because they didn't start in that format. It was hard to get past that. Mm -hmm. So I was there for two years and I only had five students at all interested in living there. One stayed a day, one stayed a week, one three weeks, and one three is, months. Is this miss still operation? Unfortunately, no. Over the years, it had a lot of different transition, and it closed, I think, sometime around 2000. So you were pretty quick to move to I, the I, Memphis Leadership Foundation? Well, no, I left in 2000. Um, I mean, I left in um, 89, from 87 to 89. I went back to Vermont for two years to open up a residential treatment center for kids in my hometown. Um, and then in 1991, I, well, there were two different spiritual journeys and physical journeys that happened. In 89, when I left Memphis, um, <clears throat> I decided to travel around the country for a while to help just clear my head about 
everything that happened in Memphis mm -hmm. the first time around and get a sense of kind of what God's will was still. And uh, a friend of mine heard I was going to travel and she wanted to go with me, but I made the mistake of saying yes too quickly. She was in Baltimore and I wanted to go to California. <laughs> so we never made it pat. We, I picked her up, but we never made it pat. We didn't even make it to Memphis on that trip. There was a lot of different experiences. I don't know if you ever read a story um, called A Walk Across America by Peter Jenkins. This man, back in the 70s, I think it was, the day he graduated from college, his wife divorced him in some upstate New York. So he just started walking across the country with his dog, Cooper. And they had different experiences. They went to the farm and, and seems they, they, different you know, they, he did he went to different places. And there was one story in the book where he spent some time with his family in Murphy, North Carolina. And so, but as I was on this journey with my friend, she saw that I was reading that book and she said, Nate, can we go to that little black gospel church listed in the book? And I said, if it exists, we'll find it. So we had our different journeys, and sure enough, we spent some time in Knoxville and then went over the mountain into Murphy that Sunday morning. And we call a number in the phone because the church doesn't have a phone, it's just some small church there. That, and, uh, and it happened about Mary Elizabeth's son against the phone. He was a pastor at this other church. <laughs> and so he told us exactly where, how to get to the church, what time it was, all that stuff. So, so we got to meet the same woman that Peter had wrote about in his book. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to catch up with David Armstrong in um, Nashville, and he, she wanted me to catch up with Peter too. But we tried, but it just he didn't. He, you know, but it was an, an interesting time. Life is full of those different journeys. But um, so that one was '89, and then in '91, I left Vermont and I came back to Memphis. At first, I just came here for a friend's wedding. Um, and at one point, I thought he was asking me to be the photographer for the wedding. <laughs> but I just got there in time to take a shower before getting to the service, so I couldn't be the main photographer. <laughs> but I had got here in 91, and then a friend of mine had broke her foot, and so I worked with her for a month in Millington. I wasn't sure if I was going to stay in Memphis at that point in time. Um, Christ Methodist was doing a, um, a weekend experience they were going up to, um, trying to think what the name of the, um, in Eureka Springs. Um, and, but I like John Michael Talbot's community up there. I thought they'd do something somewhat religious. These, these folks all wanted to spend money and go to all these touristy things. And I, I didn't have money to spend. I, you know, here I was, I'm getting ready to travel around the country again, but I don't have much money to my name. And, so I left them at, when they were getting ready to leave Eureka Springs, I did spend a little time at the um, at John Michael Templin's place. And, but, I, um, but I called this woman who, who had an ad in the newspaper wanting to go to either um, Washington, D.C. or Denver. And I figured, well, I could go to Denver on the way to California, you know, just, but fortunately it didn't work out. She, I, I called her up and I told her I was camp, camp out somewhere in between. It turned out I was calling from Eureka Springs. I made a call as if it was a local call. And she was in North Little Rock. And, and so I said, well, I'll camp halfway between. She said, i got a spare house you can stay at. And I wasn't sure about that, but I, I went there. And she showed me this apartment. And then when she came over the next morning at 6.30 or 7 in the morning, she said, Nate, you got to get out. Somebody's moving in. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I, <clears throat> do I have time to take a shower or anything? She said, no. And I said, can I take a shower at your place? And she said, well, I won't look good because, you know, my coworkers, you know, for it. And I'm going, you're thinking about going on this trip with me and it's not going to look good if I take a shower at your place. And so... Did you ever make it to California? Uh, not with her. <laughs> <laughs> I got, later in the day, I went to where she worked at this laundry bag. She said, Nate, I'm glad you're here. You can take me to the bank. I took her to the bank. I didn't go in with her. Um, I, she comes out a little while, but she never talks to her boss about taking this trip. And we go back to her place, and she said, Nate, I'm sorry, I don't have any trip, money for the trip. I said, Faye, have a good life on that here. <laughs> 
decided that was not going to work out. <laughs> but as I left um, North Little Rock, I picked up a couple of hitchhikers headed to California. Dave and, and Dan, and one of these two guys, had not seen his dad in two years. So, but on this journey to California, we went to Albuquerque, and sure enough, that's where his dad was staying. So, mm -hmm. um, so he was able to spend some time with his dad. But I had decided that I had enough of their companionship. <laughs> it was an interesting journey, but um, I decided to go up into, um, I went up to Flagstaff and I was going to go up to the Grand Canyon for a little bit and go visit my sister in Utah. Um, and they said, but Nate, can't you take us to California? Huh. And I said, no, that's, you guys can either stay here, go with your dad when he goes in a couple of weeks, or you can <laughs> find another way. I said, this, this is what I'm willing to do. <laughs> and so um, I then spent a little time with my sister. And, and uh, at that point, what was interesting, the church here in Memphis, I was involved with, it was then Epworth United Methodist. Um, and when I, I guess the other part of that journey was before I went to that region, that time in Eureka Springs, I had helped this church out. They had a revival going on. Or, and I was, at that point, they had somebody breaking into the church every Thursday night. And <laughs> on, we, Thursday. We, on Thursday. On Thursday. And, and it was only because this guy that <clears throat> wanted to volunteer with the after school program, he had too many life issues that prevented him from doing that. And, and the staff said, we're sorry. And so he would break in, on, it happened on a Thursday. So he would break in on a Thursday and take school supplies, and he just had them at his, at his apartment. He didn't do it, it was just, and, and it was, so, but it was interesting, you know, it was, it was an interesting time, but. How did you uh, find Memphis Leadership Council? Well, okay, so let me get back to that one. Oh. So, yeah, that one, that one, so this was, so when I get back from my trip around out to California, I decided to settle in Memphis, and, um, Nobody told you that well, when you come to Memphis more, once you come to Memphis and you leave, you always get drawn back. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was um, and, but the, the church, what happens is the Ch Epworth Church, where they had this revival, when I'm at my sister's in Utah, the church tells me, Nate, we've decided to let you live in the house next to the church rent free, because you did this at the revival, you just continue to look after the church. So I said, well, you know that would help if I'm in, and so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. You know, you know, to have a free place to live is always good. <laughs> so, so I came back, but the people that were in the house didn't know the church had made this decision, and so there was no room for me at the house. <laughs> so I went and stayed with a friend in Billington for a little bit until there was some house transition. So the house next to the church was kind of a a, it was called Freedom House. It was a three-quarter house. It was mainly for people in recovery, um, but it didn't have too much um, structure. And um, so, and then um, <clears throat> so I lived at that house. But and the church was wonderful in the sense that in the early '90s, Epworth Church and Bethel United Methodist Church, both churches, Epworth being a white church and Bethel being mainly a black church, they both voted to close and form a new church, and it was Good Samaritan. So that happened in the early 90s. They formed the Good Samaritan Church? Yeah, mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. And so at that same time, my background is in social work, and I was working anywhere and everywhere. I mean, I was dressing up in a tuxedo, delivering chocolate chip cookies for the cookie <laughs> florist. I was working at Genesis House, Peabody Residential Treatment Center, Family Link, I was working in all these different places. They were good things to me, but it just wasn't, it wasn't really feeling, it was paying the bills, but it just wasn't feeling like that's where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so I opened up a computer lab at the church and to give kids an opportunity, um, other than stuff on the street corners. And, and we ended up writing, I mean, I guess the, the, the way the story, the best way to explain it, at the same time, I was trying to figure out what God's will for my life was. 
I was house sitting for some friends, and <clears throat> in my prayer life, I wanted a picture of 2020. And so, um, if you can imagine, in this one room, the one the bookcase is the wall is a complete bookcase, and in the center is a television set. And I get four pictures. In one picture, everything is there: the books, the bookcase, the television. It says Nightline. Another picture, everything comes back, back, and it's black except for the center, which is a crisp, clear picture of the television set with a blue screen and the letters 2020. <laughs> and then one picture comes back, everything is red, except for the white box in the middle. So depending on your interpretation of scripture, you know, without a vision, people perish. And so at the same time that that happened, while I was house sitting, I took a picture of a computer and the church directory for Good Samaritan kind of in bed together. So cooperative computer ministry was born at that point, but we didn't have any funding for the program. So I set up this lab at the church. I was doing stuff with a, a ministry called Jericho Road. Um, a, a minister by the name of Rich Cook started this other program as well. and It was matching resources to people. And so I was considered a volunteer for him as well. But we were doing some wonderful things, but there wasn't money involved. In and so we ended up writing a grant to United Way, um, and this was in 93 or 94. And it was going to be through the Center for Independent Living. And so, and the name of the program was going to be REAP for resourcing, access, resourcing Equipment for Access to People. So I'm on vacation in Vermont, uh, probably in 95, and I get this phone call, this lady says, They've honored the grant. And I said, what grant? Because it had been two years since we applied. <laughs> and so United Way, had, you know, they were apologetic that it was put on a bag burner or something. So I quit my job at the runway shelter to do this program. And we were going to use um, the old Fraser Heights United Methodist Church building because it was handicap accessible. And then they said, but Nate, there's only enough money for you to work 10 or 12 hours a week. And I said, well, can I live on 10 or 12 hours a week? <laughs> I said, well, I'm living rent-free, and I, I do have to help out with utilities and stuff. And, you know, we had some bills to pay, but, you know, so I was trying to juggle that as to whether I could do it or not. Unfortunately, I had made some financial mistakes with my mother and my brother. And, but, um, so uh, I decided to take my old job back, working nights at the runaway shelter, and doing the computer ministry in the, during the daytime. So that all that was in '96 when they actually when the grant actually happened, and we were at this church and everything was going pretty well. Um, and then <clears throat> the next thing I'm going to speak there is I wasn't there, so whatever I say may be a little bit out of turn. Mm. But what happens is. Urban Youth Initiative, which is one of the arms to Memphis Leadership Foundation, they were having a retreat one day. And at this retreat, this man was asking these youth workers <coughs> about their computers. And he says, what happens when your computer breaks down? And four or five different people in this, at this retreat said, well, we just call Nathan, he comes by and fixes them. And the, the man says, well, do you pay them? And he says, no, he does it as a ministry out of his church. Sometimes he has to ask us for donations for parts, but, you know. And then the man says, well, can you pay him? Then my friend Diane says, well, I'm not sure. He's, things aren't working out the way he wants here in Memphis. And he might move to D.C. or back to Vermont. So she set up a job interview for me without me really knowing it. <laughs> with so, Memphis Leadership With Foundation. Memphis Leadership Foundation. So, so what happens is, <clears throat> you know, there's eight people there for this interview that show up one day when I'm, at the church, <laughs> and so and so they they tell me a little bit about the meeting and, and what happened, and they they said we would like to take over <coughs> cooperative computer ministry. We want to hire you as our computer administrator, and, <coughs> and you can do CCM still, but you know. So that was in '97 when Memphis Leadership Foundation <coughs> did that. And so, um, so I've been working there for 16 years. Uh, Memphis Leadership Foundation has been around for 25 years now. Um, 
Larry Lloyd um, was the, the founder of the of Memphis and Chip Foundation. It's moved from a few different locations, but right now it's at 1548 Poplar. That's a pretty good sized building. Man. Yeah, the old the old Baptist Brotherhood Commission building. But it, it's, Is that what it was? Yeah, um, and so there's a lot of different ministries are involved. Um, so that's not one ministry that's behind the Memphis Leadership Foundation. It's, it's, a, like a, of, it's a number of different churches are involved in it. Memphis mm -hmm. Leadership Foundation is its own entity in the sense that it, it's not. It's supported by a number of churches, mm -hmm. but it, its vision is to you know reach both kids and adults. So it has its own board and its own mission. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. its own board, its own mission, and it, it also likes to be an incubator for other ministries as well. So there are some other times, there are times that different ministries will come in and be a part of it for a while and then go um, kind of spin off as well. So Memphis Leadership Foundation and Streets Ministries were and economic opportunities and, and neighborhood housing opportunities. Those were the three or four major ministries that were part of it. Um, Economic opportunities um, moved um, more out towards the, the old you know, depot on airways, and they do a lot of job training with adults that are um, mainly people coming out of prison, but they're trying to do some. They didn't. They didn't account for how much space uh, cooperative computer computer industries would require. Did they? Um, no, um, <laughs> that one was. My space issues are, are always, always issues, there. Always there. I, can, I never know what a donation is going to become. Um, you want to describe sort of what happens sure. and how it operates? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Cooperative Computer Ministry um, is designed to try to both help people. We both teach people how to fix computers and teach people how to use computers. But also, we try to give away 10 a week to different churches, schools, and other nonprofits. Um, but my personal belief is that um, if a computer stands in the way of your relationship with other people or with God, get rid of the computer. <laughs> so it's one of those things. It's a, it's one of those things that I we misuse resources all the time. You know, in the worst case, we misuse people in terms of inadequate shelters or nursing homes that just don't have enough support for them. You know? And um, and computers, what I'd like to see with the computers is both young and old, rich and poor, black and white, working together to solve problems, whether it's around the computer or something else. The, the, the computer is just a tool to help in that ministry is how I look at it. Too. <laughs> but in terms of the history, I mean, I never know what a donation is going to be. One day I got a donation of 79 pallets of computer stuff. It's... <laughs> You know, and imagine, and that came out of the post office. You know, some. some Is a lot of that usable? Um, at that time, it it could have been more usable than it was, but space was a problem, and I had to turn it around as quickly as possible. I can remember visiting uh, your facilities there one day and seeing twenty or thirty Toshiba flat laptops. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the problem is when people donate laptops, I don't get their hard drive or I don't get power supplies. So there's some things that I have to buy to, to make yeah, something complete. to complete it. So, so my desktops, I, I can interchange parts enough to not have to typically buy anything for a desktop. There's usually enough donations to make other things work. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the laptops, we do have to buy some parts for from time to time. Mm -hmm. But um, the... Um, I can still give away a 386, which is uh, just an old DOS program. My first computer. You know, <laughs> just with a little kid's menu. Mm -hmm. If kids are at a daycare going to use a computer for the first time, they're going to put gum in it, candy in it, maybe a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You want them to mess up something old, not something new. <laughs> <laughs> so if they can learn ABCs or some math type stuff, or if they can learn something in that process, you want them to do that. <laughs> now there's some people that I've sent to you that have gotten some fairly sophisticated desktops. I yeah, mean, were, yeah the, best, the best computers that we have received is like a 3.2 gigahertz machine, like a dual core processor, you know, they're, so 
you know, companies are getting, some companies are getting rid of the things just, that are just a couple of years old. Please keep moving ahead. Yeah, no, yeah no. And, and, and I just don't understand it sometimes. I'll go into a company and, and whether they're moving or they're doing their donating the stuff, and they still throw away things in the trash that still could be donated. I'm, I have to pull out power cord, pull out things out of the trash can. You know? I said, well, you don't have to do this. If you're, you know, you're donating this, but you can also donate this stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not always at the door at the right time. That's the other part of the problem. Yeah, now, at one time you had a warehouse way out on South Parkway what West. Yeah. And it was like a football field full right. of equipment. Do yeah, you still was, have that sort of situation? Unfortunately, no. That, that location was part of Bloomfield Baptist Church. Yeah. Uh, it was an old trucking company that they let me use there, but they've since torn that building down. Yeah. Um, there's um, Right now, the space that I use is out at the Defense Depot. The, I share space with what used to be the United Way's Gifts and Time Program. Um, but now it's the the YWCA is handling that. Now you invite people in to learn how to work on computers. Yeah. And then you have somebody that's a little further along to come in and work with the new people. Yeah, we have both. And, uh, yeah, we have both. Uh, what happens <clears throat> back in you know three years ago, maybe a little bit more. I even had, I had students from the Tennessee Technology Center, and they would come for a ten week program. And when they finish that program, I might have 50 or 100 machines fixed and ready to go to be given away. And so, um, but unfortunately, I don't have those students from there now. I have students from um, Job Corps, and I have some from Hope Works, and I have some people doing community service. Um, so the machines aren't getting out the door as quickly as I like. Um, and sometimes I do a little too much repair of other people's stuff. I do. I need to balance things a little bit better sometimes. Because <laughs> um, too often people bring something with a virus or something and, and it interrupts trying to, trying to turn you into a, a computer repair guy. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't really want to compete with the companies that don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's one of those things that you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, <laughs> in a sense. So, um, well, but, who are the who are the types of people who benefited by it? And I know, yeah. I know uh, the people that I've introduced have been people with uh, a modest ministry, or they're trying yeah. to develop something that you've helped. But uh, what's a typical profile? Well, nothing's typical in my no. mind. <laughs> <laughs> I get anything and everything. I have, if you can imagine, I I get blind individuals who want computers. And, but they need some special adaptive software from time to time. They have some, some of them are legally blind, but then they can see a little bit. So what they really want is those big old CRT monitors, you know, the 21 inch type stuff. <laughs> so I have some folks that they're in that situation. I have a lot of homeless individuals who really want laptops and really, and, and I don't like to encourage too much of that because they might get stolen. <laughs> so I try to, you know, there's, there's some of that. Um, but there's, you know, different churches will set up computer labs. And so they might want eight or ten machines at one time to set up a lab to be used. For their youth. For their youth, youth both youth or, or adults. There's some that want to do job training type stuff. Mm -hmm. So each one of the ministries at Memphis Leadership Foundation, um, they, they get computers from me if they don't have grant money to buy their own stuff. Sometimes they do get the grant money to buy something new. But, so there's Urban Youth Initiative is one of the arms of the foundation. And they probably have 50 youth workers at any one time that are <clears throat> working throughout the city and within different schools and different neighborhoods. And so a lot of them use different computer labs, and so I help support those labs as well. Um, there's like um, Youth Visions has one out in, in Fraser with the, um, the REP program, the Refugee Empowerment Program. 
at the Hamptons church. Yeah, I've visited there. that too. You know, <coughs> Amy, Amy Moritz, and we're yeah, the, we're hoping to have Amy here on the Core Concepts at some point. Yeah, she, she's a wonderful lady, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and um, let me think about there's. Um, you know, I have two volunteers who have been with me. For, one volunteer has been there for 12 years at least. And, and he comes two or three times a week. Another volunteer almost comes daily, and he's retired from IBM. He worked on more mainframe computers, so he, he didn't really know a lot about personal computers okay. and, until he started volunteering. And he's he does real well in helping to teach other people as well at this point. And I do have other volunteers that come in at different times just to teach sort of. Aspects. You're you're almost the only resource for some people. Yeah, and so and, and and where would they go? Yeah, and some people go to the library for using computers, and so so it's been a it's been a wonderful journey. Um, at the foundation itself, um, space is a bit of an issue, and I and then I have a little bit more clutter than I need. <laughs> so I'm always trying to figure out a way to make it. Better. <laughs> well, why don't we take just a moment before, because we you still we still have about 20 minutes. Okay. But um, go ahead and give our viewers an idea how they might contact you. Sure. For anything, for donating computers, yeah. uh, for uh, they want training. Donate, yeah. If, if they want to donate space, I can take that. Or donate space <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> where, give them give them your. Yeah. You have a website. Yeah. Give yeah. the website, phone number, email address, if you sure. would. Yeah. Cooperative Computer Ministry is part of Memphis Leadership Foundation, and so the website um, for MLF is mlfonline.org. Um, but there might have been a little transition, so it might have changed. So I haven't checked it lately, mm -hmm. but that will will take the right one. But Cooperative Computer Ministry has a separate web page as well, and and that one's a little bit more difficult to understand. <laughs> There was a man by the name of Peter Schoenster who gave me a computer one day for a minister. And we were talking about a web page, and, and so he offered me this web page for free. So I'm just in his subdirectory. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it hasn't changed since 1997. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but it's his, his last name is Schoenster. So it's S C H O E N S T E R dot com slash CCM. And, and so you get a web, you get a three-page web page about the, a little bit about the history of if you want to sign up for a class, you can sign up on the web page. If you want to donate something, you can put your name and address there. The main number to reach me at is my cell phone, which is 901-335-7374. Um, but my office number is 901-725-3121. And I do check those messages, but I don't use that phone as much. So you're not, you haven't mounted any kind of marketing campaign through that website, obviously. No, there's, no, there's no. Not, not a major marketing campaign. Yeah. Everything has been word of mouth, and, and there's been, there's the, through MLS web page, there, I think there's a link from one page to the other. So I, you know, I didn't bring a laptop with me to shoot. Look at that. Yeah. 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 But yeah, we don't do, I, I, I don't do as much as I could around marketing. <laughs> well, we want to get one of these, something like this, uh, some artwork, and we'll put into the Lightways easing, yeah. which goes out to about 20,000 people. It's a quarterly, and it's a complete electronic magazine, even though we do produce some hard copies yeah. as well. So we, are, we, want, to, we want to put you, uh, put you in the yeah. summer edition if we can. We're sure. working on that right now. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. And, um, yeah, so people could volunteer to either teach classes, they could volunteer to help repair equipment, um, they could, um, if anybody knows of anybody that would like to donate a building, I could always use more, more, more space. space, especially handicap accessible type space. Um, and well, anybody that's got a warehouse that's not being used, that would be perfect. Yeah, but, you know, Right now, I, I again, I have the warehouse at the depot, and I use a warehouse on Cumberland Street, which is off Scott's, I mean, off um, Broad Street, but I share that with a window company. 
So if the window if the windows company business grows too much, then I have to leave. Is that that gray building where they do auto glass and everything else? Yeah, it's windows. It's it's a window company. Out right it, right on Hollywood. No, no, this one is um, Cumberland, right before Scott Street. You go under the flyer, under Sam Cooper. Yeah, and right along the railroad tracks, basically. But it's a uh, Bell Park is the name of the okay. facility. And so. But, um, and then we'll give that phone number again, folks. So yeah, that yeah, you, the phone you, number again is 901-335-7374. And how, how far out of Memphis do you go? Do you get uh, people donating from California or needing computers actually, in Washington? Actually, um, there's a company called the National Christina Foundation, which moved recently from Connecticut to Pennsylvania. And they're a clearinghouse for donations all around the country. Of all kinds. And, and so what happens is, <clears throat> if they get a donation in Memphis, they will let a group of people know what's available. So sometimes that donation would really be coming from the National Christina Foundation, but it's John, John Smith over here, <laughs> who who's actually lives in Cordova or somewhere, who's donating machine. So mm -hmm. I get it from him, but they're the ones that actually give you all the tax credit and stuff. But it's usually multiple machines. Yeah, I, I it's think usually, it's yeah most businesses will be multiple. I do get a lot of individual stuff. I don't get much from FedEx. I get a little bit from, from FedEx, but not as much as I would have thought. Um, and then... Um, what do they do with old stuff? I'm not sure right now. They, they did have contracts with different people to, to take it away, but I'm not sure. I, my my foot is not in the right door, <laughs> yeah. so I don't don't know about that one. Um, <clears throat> one story, I, uh, one company, I don't remember if it was a a food place up in Dyersburg or something, but they brought a truck that had a dump body and just brought these computers to me and just dumped them out there. Literally and, dumped. Literally, literally dumped them, <laughs> and so. And some of it was pure trash, right? But, uh, and what wasn't was trash when they got through dumping it. <laughs> well, and so, but so, so these machines, they, at that time, they were running Windows 95 or Windows 98 still, but they put 20 gigabyte hard drives in them. Mm -hmm. But Windows 95 or 98 couldn't see all of that hard drive. Mm -hmm. So they weren't using the full partition. So we were able to reuse those drives in other places and that type of stuff. But a couple of the drives, somebody went and they broke the pins on them. So I called up Western Digital, the company that, you know, just to see if it was under warranty. And one of them was, and I couldn't understand why one was and the other one wasn't because they both had the same date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I talked to this individual and I said, no. I explained who I was and everything and I said, no. what do you do with all the hard drives that you cannot sell? He said, I know where you're going with it. We send your name up the pike and see what happens. So within an hour, I get a call from this lady, and she tells me that she's tripping over this box of hard drives, and she wants to know if I want them. And I said, sure. And she said, do you care what size? You don't care what size they are? And I said, no, I don't care what size they are. I said, yeah. So I get this box of 20 hard drives in it, and they were 120 gigabytes each. You know? And at the time, you know, if I had a 60 gig hard drive, I was doing that. Okay. Yeah. You know, and so, and but one of these was bad. And so I called up Western Digital again, I'm asking them if they'd honor the warranty. <laughs> and, and he said, yeah, just take it back to where you bought it from. I said, but the problem is I didn't buy it, you gave it to me. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll just send it back, we'll, we'll give you another one. <laughs> and so, but, but those, those things don't happen that often. They just they they happen at different times. Can you tell us about somebody in particular like that that you've helped get set up with their computers? Some uh, yeah, so some he, you know some end user there. Who's yeah, so, yeah. So um, and most recently, just this one doesn't happen too often, but there was an elderly couple who, you know, unfortunately the man has Alzheimer's and is doing so, but his the wife still wants to do email at the apartment, that type of stuff. 
and so the desktop had kind of given some trouble, but she wanted a laptop, and so she had taken different parts of the room and all this stuff. So the other the other day, I took a laptop out there and moved all the the data from the the desktop to the laptop. And, but the one thing that I had I have to you know help her understand is. She still has to have a wireless internet <laughs> to be able to use the laptop yeah. anyway. She thought because it was wireless, and I said, no, no, I just, and, but. No real confession of it. But, but the, I think the reality, I go there one night, and then the next day, somebody brings me a wireless modem that they're not using any longer. <laughs> yeah. So I can take that out to her, because it's, yeah. it, it's, an, it's actually an AT&T two-wire. Things. And so, Nathan, yes, you are actually you have actually developed a, a ministry from computers. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's, it's in. I mean, that's such a you know such a division between person and machine. Yeah. Okay. And and that you've ended up being a minister of computers. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's 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 a sign of the times that oh, almost. Everybody Anybody and everybody that's in a ministry of any kind is uh, needs need something. Needs yeah. some technology, that's for sure. And probably software and database knowledge and a lot yeah. of different things. Now, have you developed a relationship with people who sell things that that could supply these organizations that you yeah, supply? Like, like the things that like I don't have flat screen monitors. A lot of people want flat screen. I have I have a hundred and fifty. CRTs and big box. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, some people will accept those, but if they want the flat screen, you know, mm -hmm. there's a mm -hmm. there's a company that will sell a flat screen for forty nine dollars. So, you know, it's one of those. You know, there are people that. Do you refer people to build websites yeah. and all yeah. the other stuff yeah. that goes as, with it? As much as yeah. I'm trying to get more organized about all that stuff. I'm trying. You, you but, need almost a catalog, don't you? Yeah. Um, you know, they, I have different volunteers from time to time that try to get me organized, and then they give up a little bit. <laughs> well, you re really, if you have the stuff that yeah. you had when, well, when was that? Almost ten years ago. Right, I think so. Almost. If you have all that stuff and more, it's hardly possible. You, everywhere you go, you meet uh, people who know Nathan. This is the glory of Van Brocklin, and she's talking about it. ten years ago. He's supplying her with a com uh, some yeah. computer help. Someone gave me an old one, and I didn't know what to do with it. And he put, well, I didn't even know how to do anything but type. <laughs> yeah. And he made me able to uh, write, start writing on the book. Mm -hmm. So that was actually Nathan. Who and now it. I have that book, and I'm working on the publishing process. How about that? That chain, <laughs> that chain goes on. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah. So that's kind of a helping ministry, even though it's highly technical. Yeah. Well, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't think of it as being a ministry. They think of yeah. ministry as going out visiting people in the hospital, in the prisons, and one thing or another. But it's absolutely a needed, it's yeah. a needed thing. Do you know of other people like yourself? In other parts of the country yeah. that are doing this, yeah, similar part. There's similar things in other parts of the country. Um, I'm trying to. There was at one point I was I was trying to. I'd like to do the same thing both in D.C. and in Vermont, yeah. um, but there's there's a couple of different national groups that I have done some work with. They they some of their procedures are a little different than mine. There is a there's this National Association of Christian um, Computer Labs, and they do they do have some structured stuff where they do also give out computers to needy folks and all that stuff. So there, you know, I, I don't remember the whole, <laughs> but there there are a lot of there are. Some I think we ought to think about at some point a uh, you know we have ten radio shows on the. Radio by Renford Network. Okay. And uh, we might ought to think about at some point having a, a show where people can call in and ask questions about uh, yeah. about computers and about yeah. different things that they need. And of course, we have some very qualified uh, people. people working in our organization too. That, that yeah, there was. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time on this website called 
the obsolete computer helpline. Mm -hmm. And there was a wonderful website back in the 90s um, where people all around the world had questions about looking for parts or looking for advice about different things. But unfortunately, um, human nature isn't always what we want it to be. <laughs> and people started bashing one another and then eventually the curator of the website said he wasn't going to put up with this stuff anymore and he just shut it down. <laughs> well, you so, know that but, computers make you very irritable yeah. if you're not a computer person. They make you irritable. <laughs> <laughs> I found a lot of people who are just scared of them. They're yeah. very much afraid of mm -hmm. uh, yeah. computers. And so, it is a lot. I do have to do a lot to get people over their fears of computers. Mm -hmm. And that is, mm -hmm. um, I tell people computers are a lesson in patience. You know, that's the other thing that we expect. There are times that we expect too much out of technology. <laughs> and we, yeah, we want everything real quick and we want it to happen right away. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's, but it, it's been an interesting journey, that's for sure. <laughs> and, it, and it's often uh, nowhere near what you thought it was going to be right. when you start. That's yeah. uh, well, the, the process of evolution and unfoldment of, of, the, yeah. of your life. It, it yeah. uh, I mean, brings I, different. Yeah. I bought my first computer in 1990. So it was three years after I graduated college. And I paid fifteen hundred dollars for that computer. And so some some sales. And it was a three eighty six. It, it was a glorified three eighty six. <laughs> that and uh, and I got to Memphis and I bought a computer for a hundred dollars and did more than what money. <laughs> and so um, I had an office in London where uh, the space would be as much as this whole wall. Right. Uh, it was a, a, a it wasn't a mainframe, but it was what they called a mid mid something or another right. again. And uh, now, uh, the tiniest little laptop you get would do everything that that would, would do. And I've heard them talking about the same thing with the space agency about what it would take, what it takes to, to uh, for a moonshot, for instance, compared to what it used to be. It's really, uh, it's really pretty amazing. What, um, the, the, uh, your, the main organization there with Memphis Leadership Foundation. Yeah. yeah uh, what is their? What is the the actual mission of the Leadership yeah, Foundation? Yeah, it's a it's a Christ-centered organization that is to. I don't remember the words as clearly as I should, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's just to to kind of reach the whole person. It's in, in terms of the ministry. You know, it's 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 Christian-based, but you'd say holistic. It's very holistic ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't. You know, they don't want to just give somebody some food. You know, they want to teach somebody, you know, what to do. Yeah. Are there a white? What, you have what, a is ho what do you mean by holistic? Holistic means treat everything, mind, body, and spirit. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, does um, uh, do what other types of things do they do comparable yeah. to the uh, uh, yeah. cooperative yeah. computer ministry? Yeah. yeah there's this. Um, there's multinational ministries that works with um, school-aged children from other countries that are needing certain things. There's, there's like the one with Amy you're talking about there. There's that's, that's African the, families there. Yeah, that's the Refugee Empowerment Program. They yeah. have a, a little bit different flavor, but it's it is they do have some similar things. Yeah. And then um, there's also uh, Neighborhood Housing Opportunity, which is a program uh, or ministry that will help people into home ownership instead of being re just renting the rest all of your life to actually build a home. Mm. And they, they build homes. Sort of like uh, um, Jimmy Carter's program there where you go. Yeah, Habitat. Habitat. It's, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's similar, but they build homes. Um, they had some in Raleigh. They have some in, right now they're focusing a little bit on Greenlaw. Kind of uptown, there's some there too. And, and I think there's going to be some focus on um, in Orange Mound. Um, Clean up or, yeah, or rebuilding. Just, rebuilding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but <clears throat> for individuals that don't have their credit straightened out right now or if they don't have, you know, they may have all the right resources for buying a home, but something that they, they also have a kind of an interim program mm -hmm. to help get things straightened out until you can actually be in your own home. 
Yeah, but do they have the typical kind of church things like hospital visitations and? The, uh, um, not as far as from the foundation itself. Um, we don't have any kind of feeding program in terms of for the homeless or any shelters or anything like that. Um, do they have uh, regular church services at the foundation? Um, they actually have a church that worships there, but it's not part of the foundation. The foundation does have a prayer room where people can go when they need a special time of prayer. But there's no, and the foundation has, you know, monthly staff meetings, and we do, you know, pray at those meetings and, have, and that type of stuff. But there's no, it's not a church per se. Um, but there are, you know, Always. Now, I take it it's a, like a 501c3. Yeah. yeah. Therefore, it operates on with uh, uh, grant funds. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. They used to claim that they didn't take any, you know, federal stuff, but uh, that may have changed a little bit just for some of the bigger projects in terms of. Because there's some major tr programs here, and like for instance, the Heart Center with the drug rehabilitation and other. Um, uh, programs that are, are now yeah. large grant fund, grant, largely grant funded. Yeah, and so, um, and, and also individual donations. So Memphis Leadership Foundation again, is located at 1548 Poplar, the corner of Poplar and Willette, and, and the main phone number there is 901-729-2931. Um, and uh, Larry Lloyd is the president and founder of the of the place, um, and um, and Howard Eddings is the CEO of, of, of the facility. And so it's but it's a it's a wonderful facility. Um, there's and it's a wonderful ministry you have there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to think the best. the the first floor is is mainly administrative offices and NHO is on the first floor. The second floor. Um, that's where my office is on one side of the building, and then I have a classroom and repair side in the other building. Um, but then Urban Youth Initiative is using a lot of the second floor. And then we, there's also something called Red Zone Ministries, which are ministries that are designed to work in just tougher neighborhoods. Some of them may be gang related, so they, they try to help reach out to different gang members and that type of stuff. So, I want to thank you. Joe, very much for being with us on Lower Concepts and uh, very interesting and, and a completely different uh, perspective I think for a lot of our uh, for a lot of our viewers. I'd like to remind those that you are watching regardless of your religious background and uh, your faith if you are looking uh, at doing anything for anybody you have a ministry oh, and, yes. and, and you can develop your ministry just as whatever it is uh, just just as Nathan Hill has done. Thank you very much. You. And I want to thank you for being with us on Core Concepts. I want to remind you that this show is sponsored by the Institute of Applied Metaphysics, uh, Prima Healing Center, and the Church of Revelation. And thank you very much for being with us and look for the next Core Concepts. <laughs>